Welcome back students to another session of Mr. Quintana's Advanced Placement World History Review at G. Holmes Braddock Senior High School. This session is going to cover much of Europe during the Middle Ages. Europe covers about 20% of the coverage on the AP exam throughout the years. So our focus today is going to be mostly on Europe during this time period. We're looking at a time period between the years 1200 CE to 1450 CE. And one of the first things you'll notice on this slide is the word feudalism. So Europe went through a period of transition after the fall of the Roman Empire in the year 476 AD. That's when the Roman Empire collapsed during this time period. So the year 476 AD would basically equate to the Roman Empire collapsing in the fifth century. And that was a big deal in Europe because when the Europe Empire collapsed, it basically did away with any unifying centralizing force that Europe had during that time. So Europe went from being centralized under the Roman Empire to becoming decentralized when it became a feudal system. So what's the difference between centralized and decentralized? So centralized, we're talking about basically where all power and wealth is focused in a centralized area, such as a capital city, like what Rome had during their empire, where all of their power and wealth was politically and economically centered in the city of Rome. Decentralized means when power is spread out into localized areas. So what you would have in Europe in the Middle Ages is that lords and kings that ruled over their particular areas had very much localized power in their areas, and power would be spread out in that way. That would make it decentralized. So again, Europe at the end of the fifth century went from being a very centralized empire to then becoming decentralized during the Middle Ages. This period of time now when Europe enters into the Middle Ages is gonna be called the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages isn't a period of time because of the fact that they didn't pay their electric bill, right? It has, has, has nothing to do with light. What it really has to do is with the fact that it's called the Dark Ages because they're entering into a dark period of, of, of history during this time. There was a lot of war happening during this time. Crime was at an all-time high. Trade was very difficult to take place during this time because merchants always feared that they would be robbed along certain trade routes during this time. Diseases and famine were also very common. And all of this also led to a lack of technological development as well as a less of a focus on education during this time. So the dark ages, when you really think about it, if there was a lack of technology being developed, a lack of education, crime, wars, disease, famine, all of these things taking place really led people to really worry about one thing, and that was survival, right? People were really worried about when their next meal was gonna be. So again, the dark ages was a particular difficult time for Europeans living uh, during this time period. So how did the Dark Ages progress? How did people uh, live? Where did they go to turn to in terms of for help? So there were three main levels of support that the common person could turn to during the Middle Ages. The first person they would turn to would be the Lord of the manor. These were the rulers of the areas where the peasants or serfs lived in, right? So they would turn to their local Lord to uh, search for help and for economic support. Who else would they go to turn to as well for help? Well, they would turn to the local Catholic church. The church would provide answers for their day-to-day -day life, provide answers to the afterlife, right? And they also provided services to the community that they lived in. And the third level of support that the people had living in their villages were the community itself, their families, right? So people would turn to their neighbors and their family members for help in their day-to-day -day life. So the lords that lived in these areas of the Middle Ages essentially had a limited power over the serfs, right? Who were the agricultural workers that lived on the farms in these areas of Europe. Now, who were the warriors during this time? Who were the ones that would protect the serfs or the peasants? That responsibility basically fell on the knights, right? The knights were warriors that typically dressed in armor and fought on horseback. And if you notice, the key word here that we're looking at during this time period is feudalism. So feudalism 
is the political system that dominated between lords, knights, and the serfs, all living together in this relationship known as feudalism. So feudalism has within the word, if you notice, the first four letters of feudalism has the word feud. And this really centers on the fact that lords and knights that lived in various areas of Europe were in competition with themselves for resources. So feudalism centers on the word feud, which really focuses on the wars that these kings and nobles who are lords are fighting for control over. They're not only fighting for resources, but they're fighting for land, right? Land was a renewable resource. If you own land, you had a constant supply of resources and food that you could take to market and sell. So again, these kings and lords, they controlled various lands throughout Europe. And feudalism really revolved around a relationship where kings and lords would grant land to knights and knights would provide military protection and support to their kings and lords. A little bit more about that a little bit later when we look at our chart that revolves around feudalism. So you'll notice in the middle of our slide here, there's a word that's called vassals. So vassals really means a person that serves. So a king was at the top of the hierarchy. He would grant land to his lord and the lord in return would provide loyalty and protection to his king. Now, the Lord would give land then to his knights, and the knights would provide loyalty and protection to their Lord. And who was doing all this work for all the kings, lords, and knights? That responsibility fell on the serfs. They would be doing all the farm work in return for protection and the ability to keep some of the food that they would grow to be able to survive and feed their families. Now, the kings and lords were limited in some of their power because the church was the largest landholder during this time period. They also were exempt from paying taxes. So the inability to tax the church limited the power of kings and nobles during this time period. So if we take a look going forward, I'm gonna go forward two slides. And if you wouldn't mind taking a look at this chart, this chart that you see here really kind of sums up what feudalism is all about. So on the AP test, if you ever have a doubt how this relationship works, Always remember that land travels down and loyalty and protection travel back up. So the king provides land to the lords who are his vassals in return for loyalty and military aid or protection. Now, what do we call the land that the king gives to the lords? We call this land as we call this land a fief. So again, the king would give a fief or land to the lord and the Lord will become the king's vassal in return for loyalty and protection. The Lord then would take a little bit of the land that he was given to by the king. He would subdivide that and pass it down to the knights. The knights then would become the vassals to the lords. So the lords would grant land to the knights now, and the knights would then provide loyalty and protection to the lords. And then below the knights in this social hierarchy, is, are the peasants. The peasants were also known as the serfs. The peasants were expected to work the land and they also had to pay rent in the form of a tax. The rent or the tax was basically food that was given to the knights, lords, and the kings. Now, what would the peasants and serfs get in return for their service of, of farming the land? They would get to keep some of the food to feed their families they would also be protected by the knights in case they were ever attacked by knights from other communities. So I'm going to go back one slide so we could take a look at what chivalry is about. So chivalry is the code of honor that medieval knights had to follow. This code of chivalry revolved around duties or obligations that knights had to fulfill to their lords, to God, and to women in their community. So we're gonna, we're gonna first focus on the code of chivalry that knights had to follow in regards to their lords. So knights had to demonstrate mercy, courage, valor, and fairness in their day-to-day -day life. Part of their obligation also was for, to protect the weak and the poor. And they had to, above all, be loyal to their lord. The biggest sort of dishonor that a knight could follow is breaking that code of loyalty. So at the heart of this loyalty would be if a lord would ever be called by his king to go to war, what the lord would do then would be he would activate the court of chivalry 
with his knights in order to go to war and provide protection to the king. So knights were forbidden to engage in war uh, during Christian holidays. Keep that in mind. Knights were also expected to respect other knights. There's this common misconception that knights would kill each other in battle. They actually would try to avoid that at all costs in, in, a, in, a, in this way of showing respect to rival or enemy knights. So one of the things that knights would focus on would be to try to maim or wound a knight to take them hostage, essentially. It was more valuable to take a rival knight hostage and send a letter of ransom to the knight's family and to their lords in return to fulfill a demand of, for example, paying some sort of bounty or wealth to return that knight back. What would the lord that captured a knight use as collateral? They could keep their armor or their weapons until they were paid a ransom by the king's lord back to return those knights. So again, knights would try to avoid killing each other in battle. Instead, they would try to take each other hostage and demand ransom. Knights also had to be showing a degree of loyalty to God as well. They had to be faithful to God, but also defend the church. They had to protect the innocent, and that included protecting pilgrims that were traveling to holy places like churches. So part of the obligation of knights was to protect pilgrims traveling along trips along roads to pray. And they also had to be a champion against good, against evil. Part of the obligation the knights had was to defeat anybody that was seen as an infidel or non-believer in Christianity. So that included, for example, attacking Muslim armies when they were going on crusades. And again, they had to obey God even above their own feudal lord. And the last obligation that you'll notice is there was a duty to women. They had to show courtly love, right? Knights were expected to show a gentleness and graciousness to all women, and that included noble women as well. As we march forward, I wanted to show you some images of these knights or mounted warriors. You're going to notice this is a knight dressed in armor. They typically dressed in plate armor to provide protection against weapons such as lances, swords, and maces. And on the right, you're going to notice these are, now, these are knights that are jousting. So during the Middle Ages, it was very popular to hold tournaments. This was a way of knights kind of training and proving themselves to their lords uh, in battle. And this is a way, again, of kind of fighting and practicing without actually going to war, right? Jousting was normally held in tournaments, and this was a way of knights not only gaining respect, but they were able to gain fame and fortune throughout these tournaments. Here you'll notice on the bottom left, the knights and the very popular weapon that they would use, would, which would be the sword, right? You'll notice on the, on the right-hand side, a full diagram of knights and their armor. It would take a very long time for knights to get dressed in this armor, so they typically had squires who were learning to become knights. They would basically be in charge of being errand boys for the knights, and they would help dress the knights in their armor. And on the top left, you're going to notice knights marching into battle on horseback. Notice the most popular weapon the knights would use in the background were the lances or spears that they would carry into battle. And here you're going to notice a typical medieval village, right? And at the center of the village is at the very top, which is the manor. The manor is where the lord or the knight would live in, right? These manors could eventually evolve into larger structures that we know as castles. And you're going to notice on the bottom here of the diagram, this is where the common people, the serfs or the peasants would live, right? They typically had some land on the left here that you'll notice. This land on the left is being used to be able to have sheep or goats be able to graze, right? It's known as pasture land. Notice the serfs' houses are all along this area of the road here. The church, of course, is an area here. They would be exempt from taxation in terms of land and taxes. And then you're gonna notice that there are fields, the first field, second field, and third field, which is being used for farming. We'll talk more about that later on. And then you're gonna notice the barn was being used not only to house animals, but also to store crops. There would be typically a workshop where a blacksmith would make tools and weapons. And then you have a water mill over here in the foreground that's being used to grind grain into flour. They're using the kinetic energy of the river here to move the wheel, which is being used to grind grain into flour. Here's another beautiful image of what we notice as a medieval village. 
Notice again, the Lord of the Manor living in the background here in the estate that they would live in. Notice the village church, right? A very small piece of land that belonged to the Catholic church here. Notice the cemetery right next to it. Then you'll notice the pasture land over here on the right, which is used for sheep and for goats to be able to graze off of the grass here. You'll notice various homes, right? Made of thatch or hay of the roofs where the serfs live, right? Peasants were allowed to grow vegetables in small gardens to help feed their families, right? They were able to keep a portion of what they grew to feed their families and they would have to give the remaining crops that they would grow as a tax, as rent for their Lord or their knight. And then you'll notice that there is a mill here along the river again where they would grind grain. And then you'll notice there is an area very close to the mill, which is the blacksmith area where they would basically fashion iron tools for their farming. And here is a very large diagram again of an estate where the manor is the focal point, right? Notice manors would eventually evolve into what we know as castles, right? This is the number one that you see here. The number two is the church, right? So the church had a little portion of land for themselves, right? Number three are the peasants' houses or the serfs' houses. Number four over here is the tithe barn. So part of the way that the church would gain wealth would it be that they own some of the land for themselves, but the serfs would have to give a portion of their wealth not only to the Lord as rent, but they would have to give a portion of their wealth to the church as a donation to the church. So this barn was used as a way of housing some of the donations of food that the serfs would give. Notice the, five, the number five here is the glebe. So this is a farm area here that we notice. Number six is the bakery. So many people didn't have kitchens in their houses. So they would come to the baker, they would take their grain to the baker to have the, kitchen, uh, the, the baker bake bread in a communal oven that the serfs would use. So again, this communal oven found in the bakery is what serfs would use to grow, to actually bake some of the bread that they were taking from the grain that they were growing. Notice we'll have number seven here, which is the mill. So the same grain that is being made into flour that's taken over here to number six, the bakery, is being ground into flour here at the mill. Number eight, you'll notice on the map is right up the top here. Here we see the blacksmith shop. Notice that there's horses here within the blacksmith shop. So beside making tools, the blacksmith would also make horseshoes for the horses to be able to have the horses maintain their hoofs, right? And then number nine we see over here is some of the fields that are being tilled here for the farmers that are working here. Number 10 is a fallow field. So this is an empty field being allowed to kind of recuperate from being farmed on. Number 11 is the village common. This is again an area where that was used for pasture land for sheep and goats to graze on. And then number 12 is just a forest or woodland. Typically forests were used, were an area where only lords or kings were allowed to hunt on. They were the only ones that had the privilege of hunting in the woodlands or forests typically. So these are the beginning of the castles or fortresses that existed in the Middle Ages. I want you to notice this castle is made of wood, right? So the very first castles were made of the resources that were plentiful to them, and there were plenty of forests throughout much of Western Europe. So the first castles are made of wood. Unfortunately, we don't really have any of these still standing because many of these castles burned to the ground, but we know they existed because archeologists have dug into the ground and found the foundations of these wooden castles that once existed. But eventually these wooden castles will evolve into these, right? These are stone castles, right? So there's this fairy tale fantasy that many people have that they want to live in a castle, right? That castles are a cool place to live in, but they really weren't as comfortable as we would make them out to be, right? They're actually very cold inside. They really didn't have uh, any big source of heating, right? There was no central heating within the castle. The only way that you could really stay warm is in areas where there were fireplaces inside of rooms. So again, Castles were typically cold and damp places, also very dark inside. You'll notice just by looking at the castle, the windows are very small. There wasn't a lot of sunlight coming inside of the castles. So the reason why they kept the windows small again was to, as a source of protection, right? It was very hard for enemy armies to shoot arrows inside of the castles if the windows were small, right? This also allowed for archers inside of the castles to be able to shoot out. 
So we noticed that castles were really not designed for comfort. What they were really designed for was for protection, for the lords and knights that lived in them. And here we see, of course, that whole idea of protection, right? We see how there's a moat around the castle for protection, which is basically a waterway around it. We also notice that it's surrounded by walls, right? And they had a well to be able to draw water from. And the keep was the central building. This is where the lord of the castle would typically live. There was typically a large hall where they would have meals and large audiences in. And then they had typically in the lower levels, storage rooms and dungeons where they would keep prisoners. Here are some cool images of some of the castles that still exist in Europe today. Many of these castles have been converted into museums that you could actually visit. So let's take a look at some of these beautiful castles. As you'll notice, you see the moat surrounding it, the stone walls providing protection. Here we see this beautiful castle here within Europe as well. And take a look here, the role of women, right? And of peasants in the society. So Europe was very much a male dominated society. There was a practice that was known as primogeniture. You'll notice right here, this word primogeniture. Primo means first in Latin. Geniture, right, means family or gene, right? So families pass down power through a male bloodline from father to eldest son. Again, where we see the word primo meaning first, right? So power and wealth and land was passed down from father to eldest son within medieval society. Now the peasants were at the bottom of the feudal system, right? They had few rights, right? I want you to remember something. Peasants and serfs were not slaves, but they weren't exactly free either. They had to ask always for permission from their lord to be able to leave and travel to other villages. They also even had to ask permission from their lord to be able to marry. So again, knights um, and lords had the most amount of power within medieval society, yet serfs who were at the bottom basically had to answer to the knights and lords above them. Now, how were women treated in society? Well, noble women were seen as pawns, basically, right? Kind of like in a game of chess, where they were used as pieces in terms of marriage politics. So, in other words, noble women, they were basically married off, right? So the daughter of um, a nobleman was married off to the son of a nobleman. This is how they would create alliances and keep wealth together between noble families. So women could own land. However, non-noble women typically worked alongside men in the fields. So in terms of population, most of Europe, Europeans in fact, were peasants. So many people that live in the United States that are descended from European ancestry, if you really think about it, most of our ancestors, right, would have probably been peasant serfs, right, that lived in Europe. So in terms of these families, they typically lived in households, right? And most villages were made up of between 15 and 30 families, right? That were peasant families living in these, in these communities. Women labored in the fields, again, alongside men, but they were subordinate to them. So again, European society was patriarchal. And what does that word patriarchal mean again? It means male dominated. So this was a male dominated society. Europe's population more than doubled between the year 1000 and 1445 CE. So how did this, how did the population more than double? Well, it really had to do with the fact that they were growing, they were able to grow more food. They had better technology and better methods of farming. This led to more food. More food meant, meant that the population would increase. And in this case, it more than doubled between 1000 and 1445 CE. So here we see these serfs, right? How they would basically dress. Notice they're Clothing was very drab, right? Notice women in the foreground here were working alongside men in the fields. So what was the two field and three field system in Europe? So the, the easiest way of me kind of explaining it would be to show you through images, right? So I'm gonna actually show you through this first image, right? So here we see two fields, right? This field is being used for farming. This field is not. So what is the two field system like? So if this farm here, which is used for farming, that's equating to 50% of the land. So about half of the land being used for farming. 
they would use the they would keep the other land empty. The reason why they wouldn't utilize 100% of the land would be if they overuse the land in terms of growing crops, the crops would release waste into the soil, which would make, then make it impossible to grow crops in the future. So they had to allow the land and the soil to be able to recuperate, and they would practice what was known as crop rotation. That means that they would rotate the crops from one field to the other, back and forth, in order to allow some of this land to recuperate, and they would change the, the rotation every season. Eventually, they discovered, they discovered there was a better way of farming, and this meant they discovered what was known as the, lo and behold, the three field system. So you're gonna notice here that there is a field here being used for farming, the spring planting, this is one field. Another land is being used for farming, this is the fall planting, and then there is the fallow field, right? So I'm gonna show you a better image of this. We still use the three field system today, right here. So notice one crop is being grown here, a second crop is being grown here, while this land is fallow. So why is the system more effective? How does it lead to more food and a higher population? Well, the biggest way is by the fact that they're able to utilize more land. They went from going in a two field system that was 50% of land being used. Now in a three field system, two fields are being used, so that is two-thirds or 66% of the land being used. So they're able to grow more food this way. Now, how are they not over-exhausting the actual soil in this case? Because when you're growing one crop here and another crop here, the waste of one crop is actually going to fertilize the other crop when it rotates into it. So we'll use the example of, let's say, wheat being grown here in this field and cabbage being grown here, and this field is empty. So when they rotate the cabbage here to this field here, and then they rotate the wheat over here to the fallow field, and now this field becomes fallow, the cabbage moving to this field will now be fertilized by the waste given out by the wheat in this particular field. So again, one crop's waste becomes another crop's fertilizer. So the big advantage of this isn't just the fact that they're able to grow more food by using more land, but they're also going to grow now a variety of crops. And this is going to increase life expectancy because they're going to be able to gain better nutrition by growing a multitude of grains like wheat and barley, as well as vegetables such as cabbage, onions, and carrots that they're able to grow in their other fields. So trade during this time revolved around typically the merchants known as the burgers. Now, where does that word burger come from? Well, the word burg means walled city. It's a Germanic word. So again, the word burg means walled city. So the burgers were the merchants that lived in the walled cities during the Middle Ages. And these merchants became very motivated to acquire wealth. So they're gonna do everything they can to move up the social hierarchy. So eventually, many of these burghers or merchants became powerful as a social class. And eventually, they're going to form into what we call the Hanseatic League. This was a group of leading trading cities in Northern Europe that will unite politically by having merchants kind of pool their resources together and aid each other in trade throughout Northern Europe. We're going to talk more about the Hanseatic League a little bit later on in our presentation. So we're gonna continue on with our presentation here. We're gonna take a look at our next slide and that is Gothic cathedrals. So Gothic cathedrals were the masterpieces of medieval architecture in the Middle Ages. Now, much of the wealth that the Catholic Church uh, contained, they dedicated it towards projects in art, but as well as architecture as well. So these Gothic cathedrals were found in many cities all throughout Europe. Now, we don't know a lot about the builders who built these cathedrals, um, but we do know that much of their work was through trial and error. So as they built cathedrals, accidents did happen. Sometimes walls came crashing down. So through methods of kind of trial and error, they eventually came up with the correct designs and engineering practices to create these massive cathedrals. So they learned from their mistakes. So the best way of kind of 
knowing how Gothic cathedrals were built during this time period is by actually looking at them. So this is a diagram of a typical Gothic cathedral. Now, probably the first thing you're going to wonder is, why did they decide during the Middle Ages to build these churches so big? Because there were churches already that had existed by the late period of the Roman Empire in Europe. So why did they decide to build them so large? Well, the reason why was the following. Number one, they believed that the taller and larger they could make the church, the closer they were to God in heaven. So building large churches, making them tall, kind of took a symbolic meaning by making them closer to God. Um, another reason why the churches were built so large was to demonstrate the power and wealth that the Catholic Church possessed during this time period. And a third reason why they built the churches so large was to kind of create a sense of scale. So in other words, when someone would come into a church and they would compare themselves with the size of the church, they kind of felt small as human beings compared to the size of the church. So this is kind of a way of the Catholic Church of making you feel kind of humble in the eyes of God, making you feel small in comparison to God and the church. And then the fourth reason why they built these, these churches so large was to kind of make them attractions within, within cities. Many Christian pilgrims would travel to certain cathedrals to pray at these cathedrals. And in many of these cathedrals, they typically would house relics or artifacts that were uh, possessed by the church. So some of these relics and artifacts could be actual holy objects, such as, for example, pieces of the cross that Jesus was crucified on, or they may uh, contain bones that belong to certain saints. So many pilgrims would travel through many distant journeys to travel to these churches to pray at. So these churches kind of created a boom in the economy of the cities that they were located in, because if you would come into a town, pray at a cathedral, you would also spend some of your wealth or money on food in the village, um, staying at an inn. So again, they became kind of informal tourist attractions, these cathedrals. And they still are very much today when many tourists go to Europe, they visit these cathedrals within these European cities. So if you notice, if we were to take this image of the church and kind of rotate it by 90 degrees, you'll notice that the shape of the cathedral, no coincidence here, it's in the shape of a cross, right? Which is the symbol of Christianity. And these are some photos that I took of some cathedrals when I was traveling throughout France. This is the very famous cathedral that unfortunately suffered from a fire more than a year ago. This is the Cathedral of Notre Dame. And this is the Cathedral of Notre Dame located in Paris, France. Notice the images the, of the cathedral is of Notre Dame at night, right? You'll notice the rose window, right? One of the most important features of the church. So this window is made up of painted or stained glass of different colors. So when sunlight hits it, it creates kind of a kaleidoscope effect within the church. Here's an image of the front of, of Notre Dame during the day. And you'll notice all the tourists kind of crowding around on the bottom there. And this is an image of Notre Dame that I took from the rooftop of another building. And you'll notice the cathedral has these structures known as flying buttresses. So how did they figure out the builders how to build such large structures without them collapsing? So they built arches that would divide the weight evenly within the actual cathedral, but they also built these flying buttresses. Imagine arms kind of holding up a person straight. Well, these flying buttresses hold up the walls straight, right? These arches are being used kind of as floating columns to keep the walls of Notre Dame from collapsing. Here we see another cathedral of Notre Dame, but this one isn't located in Paris. It's actually located in the French city of Reims. This is also the city where Joan of Arc lived, the savior of France during the Hundred Years' War. So this cathedral was known to be a place where many French kings were crowned within France, right? Here we see, back to Paris, the cathedral known as Saint Eustache, right? Saint Eustache is another Gothic cathedral. You'll notice very clearly the flying buttresses here that are being used to keep the cathedral walls up. 
and this is the most famous of, of all the Gothic cathedrals outside of Paris. This one is the cathedral known as Chartres. It's the largest Gothic cathedral in all of France. You'll notice it's immense size, and I took this black and white photo here on the right, which kind of shows the effect of light coming in through the particular cathedral. And here we see an image of the inside of the cathedral. Here again, cathedrals were places of worship and prayer, but they were also symbols of power and wealth within the Catholic Church. So how did people learn during the Middle Ages? How did they end up studying? So monasteries were actually centers of learning throughout the early part of the Dark Ages. Now monasteries were places where Catholic Christian monks lived. And they became centers of learning where monks would basically transcribe books. They would also uh, provide uh, areas where they could teach other monks uh, theology, which is the study of religion and God within these monasteries. But by the year 1100, new places of learning developed. And these places of learning were essentially the universities that started to form between 11 and 1200. These universities were found in such cities as London, right? Outside of London, we had the university known as Oxford and Cambridge. So these universities formed outside of London. The University of Paris within Paris was another center of learning. And then you had also in Italy, the University of Bologna. So these universities were all centers of learning, right? They, this, was de, this was a place typically reserved for the sons of nobles to be able to study. So you had to be basically male and wealthy to be able to take classes at the universities. Now, who would be the perfect professors to provide instruction at these universities? Well, since the monks had a background in education already from the monasteries, many of the early professors at the universities were also monks. And the main subject taught was theology. Theology was the study of religion and God. And a new movement kind of formed within theology known as scholasticism. This combines the ideas of Christianity along with the rational philosophy of the ancient Greeks. So that's what was the focal point of theology, which was scholasticism. Here we see kind of the early classrooms within the universities, right? They're not unlike our own classrooms today. Notice everybody in the front row is paying attention here. This guy's kind of napping in the background here, it looks like. You have over here in the background, these, these people chatting away here, right? So, but these places were very much serious places for learning. I kind of joke about it here, but a reality of it is the professors who were the monks were the main instructors providing theolo theology instruction to the younger sons of nobles. And yes, in this image, we do see nobles, both in different colored clothing. Here we see another image of the monks, right? Instructing people at the university here, the Bible as the primary form of instruction. So even though it seems like the Catholic Church had definitely a positive side to them, there was kind of a dark side to some events surrounding the Catholic Church. And there was a great deal of persecution that was instigated by some of the popes against people that they viewed as what we call heretics or non-believers. And unfortunately, the target of much of the persecution revolved around people that were either Muslim or Jewish that were living in Europe. And the first set of persecutions happened with Pope Innocent III. He basically branded heretics and Jews as non-believers, and they were frequently persecuted, right? And the Crusades, which was another event that we're going to talk about later, kind of fueled that persecution that many people within the Christian church, including the Pope, were kind of authorizing against these heretics or non-believers. And this is going to be fueled later on in a very formalized way by Pope Gregory the Ninth. Pope Gregory the Ninth starts a motion of movement known as the Inquisition, which was a formalized interrogation method that was used to kind of weed out anybody that was a non-believer living in Europe during this time. And the punishments were very harsh. We'll talk more about those punishments in a little bit. Now, on the positive side of things, we did have people like Thomas Aquinas within the Catholic Church that wrote his book, Summa Theologica, which kind of outlined the views that he had regarding faith and reason. He tried to kind of um, find some sort of compromise between the ideas of God and religion, 
along with the ideas of reason from the ancient Greeks. Here we see the Inquisition at work, right? You'll notice we see priests or monks in the background here acting as the interrogators. We notice the executioners here with their hoods surrounding them. And we notice someone here being tortured on this wheel device, right? Where they're being stretched out and burned at the same time. So how did, who were the targets of these people that the church was focusing on, these heretics? Well, these heretics were typically, again, people that were accused of witchcraft, but also people that were Muslims or Jews living in Europe. And they basically had a choice. They either were allowed to convert to Christianity, which some of the Jews and Muslims did convert, or they were basically exiled, so they had to leave Europe. In the case of many of the Muslims and Jews that were in Spain during the Inquisition, they left to Morocco and other countries in North Africa, or they faced torture and execution if they did not convert. So another dark moment in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages in Europe, is the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death, right? So the bubonic plague and the Black Death was one of the worst diseases ever to strike humankind. It started out actually not in Europe. Many people always think of it as a European disease, right? And yes, it did afflict Europe in a great way, but the disease actually started in China in the 1330s. And it eventually arrived first in the Italian cities around 1347. So it took almost 20 years for the disease to transmit itself all the way from China to Europe. And how did it make its way so easily there to Europe? Well, it traveled on the famous Silk Road, right? So the disease of the Black Death, or also known as the bubonic plague, traveled along the Silk Road. And it traveled very easily in the 1300s because the Mongol Empire that controlled the Silk Road uh, protected the Silk Road, right? The Mongols had a vested interest in profiting from trade along the Silk Road. So they made, they made sure to maintain the Silk Road safe. And by maintaining the trade route safe, it also made it safe for diseases to travel from China all the way to Europe. So by the time the disease made it to Europe and spread, and it spread between four years primarily, from 1347 to 1351. By the time it had spread, it had killed around one third of Europe's population. And one of the reasons why the disease spread so easily was due to the lack of sanitation, right? There was poor hygiene in many of the cities. The cities were very overcrowded. And European medical knowledge was somewhat backwards, right? We talked last time in our last presentation about how the Islamic civilizations were very advanced, but Unfortunately, European medicine was struggling to advance, and that allowed for the disease to spread very easily throughout much of Europe. So who are the carriers of the disease? Let's take a look. So we're going to come back to this chart in a minute, but here's our carrier of the disease. On the bottom left, right, we notice the fleas that are the carriers of the disease. And what are they traveling on? We're going to go on a slide forward here. They're traveling on these black rats, right? So these rats they basically will have around eight or nine fleas living in the fur, right? The fleas basically are biting on the blood of the rats. They're gaining infected blood and they will find the rats will be easier, easy carriers along the Silk Road carrying these fleas. So the fleas live on the rats and the fleas will jump from the rats to individuals and bite them, right? So what happens when you get the disease, right? So you essentially um, start start feeling the symptoms of the Black Death, right? So it's called a bubonic plague because people would have where their lymph nodes are in certain, organ, certain um, glands in their body, they would have buboes forming. Buboes were basically these giant bo boils that would fill up with blood and with pus, and they were very painful. And they would, when they would burst, they would release blood molecules into the atmosphere, right, that could be inhaled. So eventually, if the boobles were bursting or if people were coughing blood out, they were, people were inhaling this in the air. So the, the disease ended up becoming from bubonic plague to pneumonic plague, right? And then becoming an airborne disease later on. So again, this disease, right? People would have boobles forming on their skin. They would start experiencing heavy coughing, fever, right? 
And eventually they started experiencing organ failure, right? So you could easily die from the disease within anywhere from a four to seven day period, right? The mortality rate was around 90%. So in other words, if you contracted the disease, there was only about a 10% chance of survival. About 90% of the people that got the disease died from it. And again, one third of Europe died from the disease, right? So let's take a look back at our chart, right? So believe it or not, there were several negatives, of course, from the disease, but also, believe it or not, some positives from the disease. So some of the big negatives, of course, one third of Europe's population died from the disease. That's a big negative, right? Nobody wants to see their family members, their mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, children dying from the disease. So this put a great stress on families, right? Many people that uh, saw their family members contracting their disease would abandon their family members in their homes and flee because they didn't want to get infected. So you can imagine the human toll that it took on families that were dying from the disease. And that obviously was a big social and economic negative, right? Now, there was a positive in the disease and spreading. And how was it a positive? The bubonic plague did not discriminate against people. In other words, people from as low as the serfs to the middle-class merchants, all the way to knights and lords and kings, right? Anybody could contract the disease. So if people from the higher social uh, hierarchy, such as kings and lords would die, as well as knights that would die from the disease, it allowed for the survivors that were in the lower part of society, like merchants or peasants, to rise up into higher social classes. So in other words, the Black Death, the bubonic plague led to upward social mobility, right? So that was a positive. A big negative was religious hatred, right? So people were seeking answers, right? And they were starting to blame certain groups, right, for having caused the disease. Some people were accused of witchcraft, right? saying that it was witches starting the disease. But another group, unfortunately, that was targeted were the Jews living in Europe. There was a large degree of anti-Semitism that are, had already existed in Europe. So the Jews were seen as a natural scapegoat. And in the city of Strasbourg in Germany alone, around 30,000 Jews were killed as a consequence of them being blamed for having started the Black Death. So that was obviously a big negative, both socially and religiously, in terms of the hatred being focused on witches and Jews living in Europe. Now, another positive and both negative that we see here on the fourth one is people losing faith in the power of the church. So the church was a source of answers for the people that lived in the Middle Ages. So when they saw this disease spreading, they were asking for answers from God and the church. And of course, the church at this point didn't really provide any real scientific answers to how the disease was spreading. They were basically blaming much of the disease and the sins of mankind, right? So on the one hand, the church was a very powerful institution. So by the Black Death spreading and the church not getting answers, it reduced the power and influence that this big organization had within European society. On the other hand, the negative is that the people that were seeking answers as to why the disease was spreading, they were not receiving them from the church. So they weren't getting an explanation, unfortunately, from one of the main authorities that they lived under in Europe during this time. So that's a big negative on the other hand. So a big positive is there's going to be a shift toward a more commercial economy. So people are going to have to find resources, right, to be able to survive. So trade will pick up to be able to fulfill the demand of resources that people need. There's also going to be another positive socially in terms of more individual freedoms, right? The lower classes that are surviving much of the plague, they're going to demand from the higher classes more freedom, right? In other words, if they don't, if the higher classes don't give these freedoms and the lower classes won't work. And since there's a shortage of labor, since so many people are dying from the disease, the survivors of the lower classes can demand more freedom. Another positive is the development of new industries. So blacksmiths, carpenters, and other new industries, right, are going to develop as a positive to fulfill the demand of the serfs and the other higher classes of society. So some of the other effects that we see here, both positive and negative, are peasant and worker uprisings. So because of the fact that labor was expensive, right, this was a big negative. So 
In other words, there were, uh, there were peasant uprisings, right? People were finding it hard to find food. They were demanding higher wages from the lords and the knights. And if they didn't get it, uprisings or rebellions would form, right? So this was a negative. Now, a positive was that eventually many of the lords and knights had to give higher wages to their serfs, right? So wealth actually increased during this time. And this was as a consequence of the serfs being the survivors of the plague. And many of these serfs that survived the plague could demand higher wages. And since there was a shortage of wage, a of, of shortage of labor, the lords and the higher classes had to provide higher wages in return. And eventually one of the biggest effects, which was a positive, was the end of serfdom, right? The peasants will be liberated because now again, there is a demand for labor since it's so expensive. So serfs will be eventually freed from their obligation of living on the land. Another positive is rural living standards will improve. Now that word rural that we see right here on the, on the bottom of our table, the word rural means the farm areas as opposed to urban, which were city areas, right? So why will the rural living standards improve? Well, you had a higher chance of catching plague if you lived in the overcrowded cities. So the places where there was less people living were less of a chance you'd get infected, plus an area where you were more likely to find food were in the rural farm areas. So these areas actually improved over time. Now, another big positive is the period of apprenticeship for artisans was reduced. So apprentices were people that were learning a new trade. So for example, a master blacksmith would take on an apprentice and teach them their trade over the course of several years. But since so many people were dying from the disease, there was a need to get people to become apprentices into master blacksmiths or other professions, right? So they reduced the time for an apprentice to have to go to school and learn from a master blacksmith or carpenter, for example, because they needed these people to work right away. So this was a positive for the apprentice because that means that he could find work right away and start making money and wealth, right? And another positive is per, per capita income increased throughout the Middle Ages as the Black Death spread. So this is a map showing how the Black Death spread. You'll notice very easily here that um, it entered in through Europe, through Sicily in this area of Southern Europe, through the port cities down here, eventually making their way all the way into the rest of Italy, right? France over here, Southern France, into Spain, right? By 1347, all of Southern Europe had fallen to the disease. By 1348, it had spread into some of the other Northern areas here. And then by 1349, we see it into areas like Germany, and eventually into England, right? Scotland. But you'll notice after 1351, that's when it spreads into areas over here in the East and Russia. Now, Poland, this area of Eastern Europe, as well as the area here near Switzerland, and the area here in the Pyrenees Mountains, they only had some minor outbreaks because these are mountainous areas, including Poland, which is very isolated, right? Not very large population. So they didn't suffer as bad of the effects of the disease. But Italy, France, Spain, England, Germany, they had some of the worst effects of the disease. So how were the other countries set up in the rest of Europe during the Middle Ages? So we had talked about earlier how there was this shift during the Roman Empire times of there being a centralized government. And now Europe during the Middle Ages that was now being dominated by feudalism was decentralized. So some of the countries like England and Spain and France began to re-centralize. In other words, the kings were trying to take more power away from the lords and become more centralized. Germany and Italy that we see up here were a little bit different. They stayed decentralized all the way into the mid 1800s. So Germany and Italy was basically divided up into very uh, strong, independent, small little kingdoms, right, all throughout. Um, there were townships and um, uh, duchies and kingdoms, right, that were spread out. So imagine Germany and Italy was basically divided into a series of city-states, essentially, right, in a decentralized way. This was a perfect environment, by the way, for traders and merchants to be able to trade. Because since there were no real powerful kings that ruled over these areas, 
compared to the rest of Europe, it was the perfect breeding ground for traders and merchants to be able to do business. England, on the other hand, started going on the road of centralization, right? So they were trying to centralize more. And we start seeing that as an example with King John. King John was trying to centralize and gain more power away from the English nobles. But the English nobles rebelled, right? And they forced King John to, to sign the document known as the Magna Carta in the year 1215 CE. The Magna Carta essentially reinstated the rights of nobles, right? Um, now, the king during this time, King John, was known to be able to arrest many nobles, right? Sentence them uh, without a trial, right? So some of the main uh, stipulations in the Magna Carta was that the king, in this case, King John, could not arrest a lord or noble without giving them a fair trial. And um, they had that right. And this was basically specified in the Magna Carta. So the Magna Carta isn't a constitution because it doesn't guarantee, for example, rights to all citizens within England, but it did give more rights to the nobles. And it's kind of the stepping stone to something more modern, like a constitution, for example. So it's a stepping stone to more modern justice. That's the best comparison I can make with it. And the Magna Carta will also lead to the development of parliament, right? So parliament is the group of, that is the ones in charge in England in terms of making laws and providing advice in terms of political affairs. So the parliament was divided up into two branches. You had the House of Lords, which was made up of nobles and the clergy, and they provided advice over legal issues and advice to the king. While the House of Commons was made up of commoners and merchants who provided advice regarding trade and taxation. So again, the Magna Carta was used to provide more rights to nobles, and it led to the creation of what we see as parliament. Here we see King John. Notice all the knights surrounding him, kind of intimidating him to sign the Magna Carta. And here on the right is the actual Magna Carta written okay, by, the, by the nobles and signed by King John. What was France like during the Middle Ages? So France is the, the site of the Hundred Years War, right? The Hundred Years War lasted from 1337 to 1453. So it actually lasted a little bit longer than 100 years. It lasted for about 116 years. and even though it sounds like a long time, it wasn't a prolonged war straight through. There were periods of intermission where there were, wasn't any fighting going on. So who was fighting in the Hundred Years' War? Well, of course, if this is a war happening in France, the French are involved, and they are fighting versus the English, right? So the English king had claimed some French territory for himself, and the French revolted, uniting France around the leadership of the French king. And this war was a very prolonged war, again, between the English and the French, right? The English are going to build a series of castles all throughout northern France in the area of Normandy. And the reason why they're building castles in France is they figured they were going to be there for a very long time. This was a prolonged war, so they needed a place to be able to hold fort. And some of the English were able to gain some French allies against the French king, but the main leader of the French that will help them in this rebellion against the English in their country is the woman known as Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was a peasant girl who was believed to have received visions in her dreams um, by God. And she was seen as the person that was gonna save France. And at first, many people didn't believe her. But when she would rush into battle wearing armor and, and demonstrate her courage, she was able to gain the support of many knights that were French and other nobles within France eventually flocked to her side. And she was able to turn the tide of war between the French against the English. And eventually she will be captured by the English and she will be tried as a witch. And part of the reason why she's tried as a witch is because they claimed that her visions of God speaking to her were basically visions of actually the devil. That's what the English were saying. And she will be sentenced uh, to death by being burned at the stake. Now, even though the French do lose one of their leaders, which was Joan of Arc, 
Eventually, Joan of Arc becomes a martyr to the French cause. And what does the term martyr mean? Someone that dies for their cause, right? Whether it's religious or political. So Joan of Arc was a martyr to her cause, which was the liberation of France against the English. And this, she becomes now a symbol for the French and they shortly defeat the English afterwards. So what are some of the effects of the Hundred Years' War? This actually leads to further centralization and unification within both France and England. Since the kings of both countries were expecting more emergency powers being given to them by their lords and knights, once they gained power to go to war against each other, after the war was over, they wanted to keep that centralized power. So this is an image of France during the Hundred Years' War. Notice all of the purple area is area that the English once controlled, right? And notice the very famous battles that are here that are noted here by 1356, right? This is one of the earliest battles of Poitiers. And then by the end of the war, the only area that stayed in English hands was Calais right here in the northern part of, Fran of France. Most of France was liberated by the French army. And this is a great cartoon. Notice it says here, start of the Hundred Years' War, 1338. They reckon it will be all over by Christmas. Well, it didn't, right? It lasted much longer than that, 116 years. And here we see both sides, right? We see on the right, we see soldiers on the English side, right? And here we see how battles were taking place. Notice knights are still fighting on horseback wearing armor, but there's a new type of soldier that is being introduced in this war. And this was the English longbowman. The English longbowman proved very effective against French knights, right? English longbowmen were trained uh, to be able to shoot these arrows using bows known as the longbows. These arrows could fly more than 300 yards into the air against an opposing French army. And the beauty of the longbow was you could take a peasant in England, train them to shoot from the longbow, and they could quickly become an effective soldier against a French knight. So we no longer see French knights or knights in general who wore armor, who were highly trained, being so effective in battle anymore. We see these poor peasant English longbowmen now being just as effective in battle using their bows and arrows. On the right, we also see another weapon that was used by this, by, in this case by the, by the French, we see the crossbow. The crossbow was a very effective weapon as well because you didn't need much training to be able to point the trigger and shoot the bolt of the crossbow. But the longbow was a, a, definitely a superior weapon compared to it. It had a longer range than the crossbow. It had more accuracy and it basically landed with more force when it landed. So the English longbowman had an advantage over the French crossbowman. Not until Joan of Arc comes in the picture, right? When Joan of Arc comes in the picture, she will lead the charge and lead the French army to victory against the English army and the English longbowmen. So what was Spain like during this time period of the Middle Ages? So Spain, for a period of close to 800 years, from the year 711 AD all the way to the year 1492 AD, was controlled by various Islamic rulers. So Spain was a country with Christians and Jews living there, being controlled by Muslim rulers from the time the Muslims invaded in 711 AD all the way to 1492. And the only area of Spain, if we take a look at this image, the only area of Spain was the northern part of Spain that was still in Christian hands. Much of Spain was under Islamic control. But over the course of several centuries, the Spanish Christian kings that survived in the north kept on pushing the Muslim armies further south. And this movement, which starts around the year 1000, is called the Reconquest Movement of Spain. In Spanish, it's known as La Reconquista. La Reconquista is Spanish for the word reconquest. And this is the taking back or the reconquering of Spanish lands that Christians are taking back away from the Muslim rulers that controlled Spain during this time. And the big, big moment that brings Spain to unite against the Muslims and ultimately achieve victory over the entire peninsula is when Queen Isabella of Castile and King Ferdinand of Aragon in 1469, when they married. So if we take a look at this image here, 
And this is an image, by the way, of the Alhambra here in Spain, right? It's a very famous Islamic palace, right? That the Muslims built. They were known for advancing much of Spain under their rule. And if you notice, this is King Ferdinand on the left and Queen Isabella on the right. And their marriage will basically unify two very powerful Christian families together. Once these two Christian kingdoms unite, they will ultimately push back the Muslims out completely out of Spain. And the biggest ally of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand is the Catholic Church, right? That is their strongest ally. And the year 1492, as we know, was a very important year in history. Three big events happened in 1492. Columbus sails out to discover the New World in 1492. The Spanish Inquisition that we talked about early, that's the persecution led by the church against Jews and Muslims, was still going on in 1492. And lastly, the Muslim rulers of Spain were finally kicked out of Spain by the Christian monarchs, Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand, in the year 1492. And, and again, just to remember for everybody, remember the Spanish Inquisition was the movement to basically root out any Muslim and Jewish influence out of Spain. And Jews and Muslims either had to convert to Christianity, leave the country, or face torture and execution. So by the time Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand basically take out the Muslims and Jews out of Spain, they will unite Spain under Christian rule. The few surviving Jews and Muslims in Spain will basically exist as minority groups left, Many of them converted, many of them left to Morocco and Tunisia. And again, much of Spain now will be under Christian control. And this is a big moment because now we see this idea of nationalism, right? Spanish language, Spanish customs, Christian Roman Catholic ideas will dominate Spanish culture during this time. And when you really think about it, it took Spain to be united under King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella to be able to root out the Muslims out of Spain to eventually become a strong united country, this is gonna lead them to be able to provide the resources necessary for Columbus to be able to sail out to the new world. So again, a united Spain led Columbus to be able to have the resources he needed to be able to sail out to the new world. So as we march forward, this is a great image by the way, I wanted to show all of you. This is an image of King Ferdinand over here Queen Isabella in the year 1492. They're outside of the city of Granada, which was the last city that Muslims controlled in Spain. And they are talking to the Muslim ruler here, basically asking for his terms of surrender, where he will eventually be leaving now and having to flee to Morocco in North Africa. So cities during this time were basically focal points to trade. Some of the important cities were Flanders, the region of Flanders in France, Northern Italy was also an area of a thriving trade that took place there. Venice was one of the most important cities of trade in Italy. And the area in northeastern France, close to Belgium, was the area known as Flanders, right? Flanders was a center of textile production. Now, textiles are fabric, and the main fabric that's being produced in parts of Europe are made of wool. So Flanders, as well as areas of England and areas of Florence are producing large amounts of textiles that are made from wool. So this is a typical medieval town. How would the Europeans attract people to their towns? Well, they would hold trade fairs, kind of like how many towns in the United States have county fairs, right? So they would hold these trading fairs to attract farmers to bring their animals to the market to shear the wool of animals like sheep to eventually take that wool, sell it to be able to be used into fabric textiles. Now, I want you to notice some things about the city. Notice how the sheep here are coming in, right? To be, to be traded and sold. Notice how congested the city is. Notice that there isn't really any paved streets in this medieval town. There is a poor amount of hygiene and sanitation. Notice how brackish the water is. So, Many of the buildings are only around two stories high. The only very large buildings that stand out in the skyline is this castle in the background, as well as the church that's kind of off screen here. These were the largest buildings. 
So one can say, when you look at a skyline of a city, you can measure what people value based on the height of their buildings. So if the tallest buildings are castles and churches, that's what they valued the most. They valued military protection and they valued religion in their society because those are the two biggest buildings in their community, in their village. Here's some of the most important trading cities. Let's see if some of you know it. So the first one on the top left here, this city is found in Turkey. Anybody have an idea of which one it is? Going once, going twice. This is the city of Constantinople. And Constantinople is now called Istanbul in Turkey. The top right, think about it, it is the city of Florence in Northern Italy, another famous city for trade. On the bottom left is a region that is near Belgium and France. This is the region known as Flanders. And on the bottom right, this one should be an easy one for everybody, known for its famous canals along the Mediterranean Sea, in, uh, along the Adriatic Sea, I'm sorry, in, in Italy. It is the very famous city known as Venice, right? So Venice is the famous city known for its canals, also a very important city for trade. These are the windmills that are being used to spin fabric for the sale of wool textiles. One of the most important ideas of trade in the Middle Ages in Europe was the Hanseatic League. The Hanseatic League was a collection of city-states in the northern regions of Europe. So what we're looking at here on this map, all of these red dots are cities in northern Europe. So mostly Germany, Denmark, Sweden, and parts of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. These cities all throughout this region there were around 40 plus cities that will unite, actually over 100 cities that will, will unite together in a trade union known as the Hanseatic League. Now, why was this league so important? Well, they, these cities wanted to help each other out to profit from trade. So they pulled their resources together, formed a league of cities where they will use some of their wealth to buy ships and hire Navy ships to protect against pirates who would rob merchant ships. And they would also come up with common trade practices. One of the things that was commonly done in the Hanseatic League is that they would lower tariffs or taxes when they would trade with each other. So if you lower taxes, that will increase trade between the cities, which obviously makes everybody happy because everybody's making wealth from all of this trade in Northern Europe. And if you notice the lines here, these lines going all the way into the Mediterranean Sea, are some of the trade routes that the Hanseatic towns were involved in. So what was the effect of this monopoly of trade in the Hanseatic League? Well, one effect was it made trade safer throughout much of Northern Europe, and it led to a new substantial middle class of merchants gaining power in Europe. And these merchants are gonna de demand over time more rights as they gain more wealth. And this is also going to lead to the development of trading operations to eventually the first early companies that we start seeing being formed in both the Netherlands and in England. This is an image of the Hanseatic League. Notice their ships, right, that are being pulled together with their resources. So shipbuilding was a huge industry that took place in Northern Europe, and this will aid in the trade. And if you notice in this image, you'll notice some of the merchants here taking out fine clothing like silk, right? So this is gonna be a combination of necessities being traded, but luxury goods coming all the way from the Silk Road, such as silk and spices and other major products. And here you will notice an image of a Hanseatic League city in Northern Europe. This is, looks like something that we would see outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands or maybe Copenhagen, right? And notice these are our merchants, our burgers, right? The, the merchants who are the growing middle class in Europe and notice all of the goods being taken out from these ships from the Hanseatic League. So what was Russia like during the Middle Ages? Well, Russia was devastated by the Mongol invasions under Genghis Khan in 1242. And for 200 years, it kind of set Russia back in terms of their development compared to the rest of Europe. Things started to change, though, because the Mongols made the fateful decision because of their lack of political knowledge in administering um, certain civilized areas 
they relied on the locals to help them run their empire. In the case of Russia, the Mongol rulers, the Khans, relied on Russian princes to act as tax collectors. So Ivan III and the noblemen who were collecting taxes from the Russian people were collecting taxes and turning over this tax money to the Mongols. But the Russians, under Ivan III and the nobles who were collecting taxes, they kept some of the tax money for themselves. Instead of giving all of the tax money to the Mongols, they kept some of it. And they used the, those resources to eventually hire soldiers and horses and weapons to overthrow the Mongols that were dominating Russia during this time. So by the late 1400s, the new rulers, the new rulers of Russia were the Russian czars. And there's two ways of spelling czar, T-S-A-R or C-Z-A-R. And the, the Russian word czar comes from the, the word from Latin, the word Caesar, which means emperor. So these Russian czars ruled very autocratically. They ruled with an iron fist. Much of their rule was kind of copied from the way the Mongols ruled over their territories. Eventually, the next czar to come into play was Ivan IV, also known as Ivan the Terrible. And he will centralize more power in Russia, but he does it in a very ruthless way. He was extremely paranoid. He believed that many of the Russian nobles were out to overthrow him. So he will use a group of secret police to spy on nobles. And eventually, that's how he was able to stay in power through his paranoia. We'll be covering more about Ivan the Terrible and how he eventually dies in one of the later PowerPoints. So here we see the massive area of Russia, the expansion of it from Western Russia with its capital in Moscow, eventually to the east. Here we see the Mongol soldiers defeating the Russian soldiers. And then here we see, of course, the eventual Mongol invasions that are going into the rest of Europe, where they eventually withdraw from. And here we see the Mongol soldiers on the east decimating Russian troops. So again, the Mongols killed millions of Russians in their invasions of Russia, which led to a huge amount of devastation that set Russia behind both economically and politically compared to the rest of Europe. So on the left, we see Ivan III, who is gonna be responsible for defeating the Mongols in Russia. And then Ivan IV on the right, also known as Ivan the Terrible, who will be the one responsible for centralizing power under the Tsar's rule. And he did this in a very paranoid fashion through the spying of the nobles. So the last thing that we're going to cover today when it comes to Europe in the Middle Ages is the Crusades. The Crusades is definitely one of the bloodiest conflicts in world history. And it's a conflict between Christian Europe and the Islamic Middle East. So why did this battle happen in the first place? Why did this war happen in the first place? Well, as the Islamic empire expanded in Europe, especially in Spain, the Christians felt threatened by the expansion of Islam into areas of Europe. So they, at this point, tried to find a way to unite and defeat the Muslims that were controlling much of the Mediterranean region of this world. So at this point in time, a group of Muslims known as the Seljuk Turks had conquered the area of Palestine, also known as the Holy Land, and also known as present-day Israel. So the Holy Land, that was an area that had been controlled by Muslims under the Abbasid Caliphate, was now controlled by a new group of Muslims known as the Seljuk Turks. The difference between the two Muslim groups, though, is the Abbasid Caliphate allowed Christians to be able to pray in the Holy Land. The Seljuk Turks, the new group of Muslims known as the Seljuk Turks, though, they did not allow for Christians to be able to pray in Jerusalem, which was one of the most holiest cities of uh, Christian faith. So at this point, the Christians begin to rally under the Pope. In this case, it's Pope Urban II. In 1096 CE, they rally under his support to take back the Holy Land from Islamic Muslim control. And the causes of this conflict are primarily, in this case, religious. They wanted to liberate 
the Holy Land from Islamic control and put it back in the hands of Christians. They wanted to allow Christian pilgrims to be able to travel from Europe to the Holy Land and be able to pray in Christian shrines and churches. So this was one of the main reasons why the Crusades begins. Another major cause of the conflict was the Pope, in this case again, Pope Urban II, saw an opportunity to mend the political divide between the Greek Orthodox Christian Church of the Eastern part of Europe, along with the Roman Catholic Church in the West. So the Christian, the Christian Eastern Orthodox Church was asking Pope Urban II for help. They essentially made a bargain. The eastern part of the uh, area of the Mediterranean under Orthodox control, the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Emperor of the Byzantine Empire reached out to the Pope and asked the Pope for help. And what was help in the form of? If Pope Urban II would liberate the Holy Land and give it to the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Byzantine Empire, in return, Pope Urban II saw it as an opportunity to bring the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church united again. So again, this was kind of a trade for land. Again, the land that would go back into the hands of the Byzantine Empire if the Christian Crusaders won. And in return, the Pope would get what he wanted, and that would be uniting both churches together against the Islamic threat. What was another major cause of the war? The other major cause is trade. Trade was a major focal point because the area of the Holy Land was the ending point of the Silk Road that started all the way from China and made its way all the way to the Middle East. So the group that controls this area of the world, the Holy Land, the area known as Palestine, controls the access of goods traveling along the Silk Road. So essentially what the Christians hope to do is if they control this territory, they will able to control trade flowing along the Silk Road. Essentially, they will cut out the middlemen who are the Muslims out of the picture and be able to gain products at a much lower price by controlling this territory that was a center of trade. Lastly, another big reason why the Crusades happen is for land and power. Many of the Christians that were traveling were the younger sons of noblemen. And the unfortunate part for these sons is that their older brothers, because of the idea of primogeniture, they were the ones that inherited land from their fathers. So the younger sons didn't have an opportunity to gain wealth. Their, their way, their escape, was to go on adventures and go to war in the Crusades against the Muslims in the Holy Land. So if these younger sons couldn't inherit property in Europe, well, guess what? They could go to the Holy Land and be able to take over land for themselves and become lords in a new land. It wasn't just, by the way, younger sons of nobles that were going on crusades. Also, many peasants went on crusades as a way of gaining wealth and treasure through the conquest of Muslim lands. So we see some of the causes of the crusades are religious. In the case of the Christians wanting to rid the Holy Land of Muslim control to gain access to shrines to pray. Some are political by bringing both the Catholic Church and Greek Orthodox Church together in unity against the Muslims. And some are economic and political as well in the sense of Christians gaining access to trade along the Silk Road, as well as the younger sons of nobles and peasants gaining land and power in the Holy Land through their conquests. So what was the result of the Crusades? Well, the Crusades started in 1096, and let's take a look at this map really quick. We're going to go forward. They lasted for a little bit more than 100 years. There were eight crusades total, but the most well-known crusades were the first four. The first crusade, as you'll notice, was somewhat successful. They were, the Christians were able to gain some of this land here in the Holy Land. Now, this is the area of the focus here in the Holy Land that we're looking at. So all of the purple area here in Europe are Christian lands, all of the yellow area of North Africa and the Middle East is Muslim. So these, this, perp, this, I'm sorry, this reddish area that we see here is territories that the Christians conquered after the First Crusade. But this won't last too long because by the end of the First Crusade, the Muslims will have a leader that they will rally behind. And that leader is this man here, as I march forward. 
Their leader is Saladin, also known as Saladin or Salahuddin in Arabic. So Saladin or Salahuddin was the leader of the resistance for the Muslims, and he will emerge victorious after several other crusades. So the Christians will continue furthering on other crusades, but all of them will prove unsuccessful. So if we take a look here, we'll notice these are Christian crusaders leaving from Italy on their way to the Holy Land. Here we see the two different types of soldiers. We see the Saracens on the left, who are Muslim soldiers, versus the Christian knights on the right. Here we see a Christian knight fighting against two Saracen Muslim warriors in the Holy Land and the Crusades. And here we see when the Muslim warriors under Saladin finally retake Jerusalem. So the Christian knights had taken over Jerusalem for a short period of time, which was one of the centers of Christianity when it came to the death and resurrection of Jesus. So they wanted to take the city and bring it into under Christian land, under Christian power and hands. But eventually the Muslim armies under Saladin retake the city and put it back under Muslim control. So what was the long-term effect of the Crusades? Well, for one, it led to, to centuries of mistrust. There is a lot of deep mistrust between Christians and Muslims throughout history due to the events of the Crusades. And much of it is dealing with the fact that the Islamic forces in the Middle East felt animosity toward being invaded by Christians in their territory. So this will lead to a great amount of political division and religious division between the two religions, right? Between Muslims and Christians. Another major effect was this was one of the bloodiest events in history. A lot of death, rape, and pillaging took place due to this war. And what we notice is, is that millions of people died in the name of religion and God, right? And it's ironic because both Muslims and Christians follow the same God. They're both monotheistic and follow the same God. Allah is simply the name for the Muslim God. So they follow the same God, and yet they went to war over religion, politics, and economics in this case. Now, there were some positive effects to the war. Now, in terms of the Crusades and these wars, Europeans are going to bring back new knowledge of astronomy, Islamic medicine, algebra, and they're going to take some of these texts, which are Arabic books, they're going to translate it in Europe, and they're going to be able to bring back new knowledge to Europe due to the invasions of the Crusades. Another major positive is they're going to gain access to these luxury goods of silk and spices, that obviously had already existed in Europe, but because the Crusades are bringing back more of these goods, this will only increase demand for these goods later on through Europe. So as we march forward, I just wanna give you guys a taste of what's to come. We will be talking about the Song Dynasty during our next presentation. So get ready for it. I hope you guys have a great night. Stay safe and all the best to you and your families. Have a great night. Bye-bye.